first thought in the day or the night Waking and sleeping, thy presence my life Be thou my wisdom, be thou my true word. I ever with thee, and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, and I thy true Son. Thou in me dwelling. And I with be one Be thou my breastplate My sword for the fight Be thou my dignity Thou my delight Thou my soul shall Riches I heed not, no man's empty prayer. Thou mine inheritance now and always. Thou and thou only be first in my heart. I, King of heaven, my treasure. Oh
My name's uh, Chris Chambers, I'm the Community Outreach Worker at Crossway Stratford. Uh, welcome to our online meeting this evening. Tonight we're going to be uh, thinking about and dwelling on uh, the beautiful, the wonderful truth um, that God saves, our God saves. Listen to the way that uh, Psalm 68 verse 20 puts it. Our God is a God of salvation and to God the Lord belong deliverances from death. God is the author, the source, the foundation, the wellspring of salvation. It comes from him, belongs to him. So let's praise him for that with our first song. that salvation that we've just been singing about well we run away we reject it we reject God we uh, sin we err we stray but 
that those who come to God confessing their sin, asking for forgiveness, that his hand is always outstretched, ready to save. So maybe take a few moments and think about some of the ways that you might have strayed, that you might have erred this week. Uh, and then we'll pray the prayer of confession together. So let's pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, in the evil we have done and in the good we have not done, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Hear these words from Romans chapter 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Knowing this, let's keep singing. Yet no. 
say our family prayer now um, and after that James is going to uh, continue to lead us in prayer. So let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we are so grateful that you are a God of salvation, that we need not fear death, even as that subject is constantly portrayed in the media. Thank you that we as Christians are united in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, so that we will know that we will be with him in the new creation forever. May we have the courage and conviction to make Jesus known to a world which is perishing. In Jesus' name, Amen. Father, we thank you that you have given civil government to promote good and punish evil. May we be dutiful citizens to help the government in this task. We pray in particular for wisdom for our Prime Minister Boris Johnson as he makes a decision on removing COVID restrictions. Pray that these restrictions would end and pray for peace as many people's expectations have been disappointed. Um, we also pray that the Prime Minister would trust in the God of salvation and we pray that in all things we as Christians would honour government while remembering that Jesus Christ is our ultimate and final Lord. In Jesus' name, Amen. Father, we pray for the church in Canada, where Christians and churches are facing major persecution, with unequal treatment and many pastors arrested for meeting as church, um, with Grace Life Church in Edmonton, Alberta, having two literal fences erected around it to stop people attending. We pray for the salvation of the, of the Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and Alberta's Premier Jason Kenney, that they would live up to the Canadian Charter of Rights they are bound to uphold. In Jesus' name, Amen. Finally, Father, we pray for our mission partner, Portia, as she returns to Ghana. Thank you for healing her abdominal pain without medication. Pray that her time with real life students in a two-week residential in the book of John will bear much fruit. Uh, that she would find, or has borne much fruit, actually, that she would find suitable accommodation for the longer term. And we also pray that she would find a Christian sister to be a prayer partner so that Portia may be encouraged to make Jesus Christ known that many may come to salvation. In Jesus' name, Amen. Summer is fast approaching, isn't it? If it's not already here, it depends which day you're on, to be honest, at the moment, doesn't it? But um, as we draw towards that time of the year, um, how, how can we think about making the most of it? How can we think about uh, enjoying our relationship with the Lord more and more, deepening it, uh, and not drawing back from it. Uh, well, Sam Gamblin has, has done some really good thinking for us on this, and he's um, drawn up a, a list of resources um, for us to think about um, perhaps using, integrating into our lives over the summer um, that, that we think you would find helpful. So he's going to explain a little bit about that now. Hey, guys. I want to give us a couple of resources that I hope will really help us in the summer 
keep going in our relationship with the Lord. I don't know about you, but summer is a time when uh, we can plateau a little bit spiritually. Maybe we're not in London. We're not hanging out with Christian mates as much as we normally would be. Maybe we've got that mentality, which I know I've certainly been guilty of, the kind of uh, time off work, so kind of time off everything, time off God. Uh, But uh, we're going to have to be intentional if we want to keep going through the summer, keep growing through the summer in our relationship with the Lord. And so here are a couple of resources that I hope might be really helpful, not just for the summer, maybe immediately, maybe after the summer, to help us do just that. We're going to be thinking about reading the Bible, we're going to be thinking about just uh, dwelling on Christian truths, and then we're going to be thinking about praying and singing. You are the ever- okay, here's a couple of apps that will help us dig into God's word. Let me introduce you to Redeeming Time. Don't know if you've heard of this app. It does exactly what it says on the tin. All those little lost moments in the day, those seven minutes here, those five minutes there, that let's face it, we often use to uh, grab our phone and scroll through Insta or check Facebook or Twitter. This app is, is saying, why not use those little loose moments to get into God's word, to hear our Father speaking to us? Let's say that you've got, I don't know, seven minutes free. Open up Redeeming Time instead of clicking on your Insta page and uh, instead of clicking on your Insta app and, and, and the, then, then tell, tell the app exactly what you've got in terms of time on your hands. So let's say seven minutes and then the app will tell you exactly what you could read within seven minutes. Maybe it's a psalm, maybe it's the whole of the book of two Thessalonians. And it gives you loads of options of different things you could read in that time. Click on it, have a read through, scroll through some of God's word, uh, digesting it. And then at the bottom, there's a couple of little actions. Could you share a truth with somebody? It has something struck you that you might want to, has something struck you that you might want to pray for. And in your seven minutes, rather than aimlessly scroll Insta, you've purposefully looked at some of God's word. Now let me tell you about an app called Dwell. Dwell is an app that costs £30 for the year. I'm doing a free trial at the moment, so I don't know loads about it, but so far what I've seen is fantastic. It's the whole of the Bible in essentially kind of albums, so you could choose the album of Hosea or you could choose particular verses, and it it, is read to you almost like a a soundtrack. You can choose who you want to read it to. It's not like those Bible apps that have essentially kind of one robotic American male speaking the whole of the the Bible. You can choose a variety of different voices and you can choose a variety of different background tracks to have playing quietly underneath those voices so that you can have scripture read to you in a really colourful way. You could choose particular playlists where... um, the, the app has, has grouped soundtracks of God's word uh, according to a particular theme. You could even dwell on one or two verses again and again and put those on repeat. It gives you the option as well to be speaking along, be speaking the Bible as it's read so that you're hearing God's word and saying it too. You just kind of flick across and, and as it's being spoken, you can, you can speak along. I don't know loads about it, but so far it's looking like a really great app to be getting me into God's word each morning. So why don't you check that out? Maybe maybe try the try the free trial. Summer can be a great time for reading a book and dwelling on Christian truths. If you haven't done so, I'd really encourage you to read Gentle and Lowly. Even if you have, it would be great to read that again through the summer, I reckon. Short chapters, you could take one each day as a devotional. You could read one chapter a week through the summer. Gentle and Lowly. Do check out the review that uh, we gave on it a little while ago, around Christmas time, when we were thinking about Christmas reads. But there's another read I want to introduce to you, and that is Fearing, no, not Fearing the Lord, Rejoice and Tremble, a book about the fear of the Lord. I think I've mentioned it once or twice before. It's by Mike Reeves. It's fantastic. It's really accessible. Uh, Let me read something off the back of it. Modern people often view the fear of God with disdainful suspicion, but Reeves shows us that godly fear is really nothing other than love for God as God. Mike Reeves is showing us why 
the fear of the Lord is a wonderful thing. And it's a thing that is often misunderstood, I think, when we read about fearing God in scripture. So you could check that out and have a read of that. If this feels a little bit too heavy for you, Mike Reeves has done an even more accessible version that is a little bit slimmer with a few paragraphs cut out. And you can buy both of those on all good Christian booksellers or Amazon. There are so many things to pray to our Father in heaven about. But have you ever had that situation where you decided to pray? You maybe had 10 minutes at the start of the day where you, you want to commit things to the Lord and your thoughts are just jumbled. You don't really know what to pray for. You know there were lots of important things to be praying. You know there are people in your small group that you want to pray for. You know that there's a, a mission organisation who are doing great work in Africa that you want to pray for. But your thoughts just get a bit jumbled and you've forgotten things. Prayer Mate is an app that essentially helps to plan your prayer life, helps to put things into particular categories. You can write things into the Prayer Mate app so that it will remind you to pray for things. You can subscribe to, to special feeds of other churches that we partner with or mission organisations and those will get updated in the Prayer Mate app. And as you come to pray, you can open up the app and it will give you suggestions of things to pray for. for. And you swipe through, you get the next thing to pray for. Or swipe through, you get the next thing to pray for. Swipe through, oh, it's this person from my small group that I promised I would I'd pray for them, yet I always forget. Uh, so, so it's a really, really great way of um, helping you to, to pray, really. Uh, it doesn't do all of the work for us. Um, but, it, but it does help when you get to that moment where you want to pray and your thoughts are a little bit jumbled. So why not give Prayer Mate a go uh, to help you in your prayer life? You reign forever. I shouldn't finish this slot on resources without reminding you of some of the resources that we've created. We've got our own Crossway Stratford app that can be downloaded to pretty much all devices. It's got all of the sermons that we've ever preached on there. And it's got a podcast too, where a familiar a familiar voice will uh, pop up and read out a psalm and pray before the psalm and after the psalm. And those are podcasts designed for you to start your mornings with and for you to finish your, your, your evenings with, finish your day with. And we've also got a SoundCloud page where all of the uh, music that, that we've, uh, we've created, that Sam has brilliantly recorded and brought together, is, is put up so that you can be having truth, again, sung to you by familiar voices, or you can be singing along to it wherever you are as well. There's the YouTube channel too, of course, which has loads and loads of content on too. So there's quite a few resources to help us. I do hope that some of those things might be new to us. Give them a try and uh, let's be praying that they fuel our, our walk with the Lord through the summer period. Today's reading is Psalm 22, starting at verse 1. That's Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued, in you they trusted and were not put to shame. For I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me, they make mouths at me, they wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord, let him deliver him, let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb, you made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me, like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. 
it is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot shed, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. The dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones, they stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him, and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust. Even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation that they shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. Hi everyone. Let me, let me pray before we begin. Father God, please bless us with your word today. Make us in awe of you, we pray. Fill our hearts with praise. And help us by your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder, what's your pain threshold? How much suffering are you able to put up with? before you say enough is enough. There's a hold that wrestlers do, I mean, don't ask me what it's called, um, and they'll hold their opponent in that painful position until they uh, repeatedly tap their hand down on the ring and say, I give up. That's the concept, but um, of course, we're talking about real pain that uh, real people experience in real life. Uh, the real pain of, of loneliness, of relationship breakdown, of people not respecting you, of people uh, 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 gossiping about you, um, feeling like your life is falling apart, experiencing the debilitating effects of uh, serious illness or injury. I wonder how long will we last in intense real world suffering? How long will we hold on to our principles? How long will we keep trusting, uh, keep praying to God and ultimately keep being a Christian? The point of Psalm 22 is, is not that Christians are expected to be like a, a burly wrestler laughing in the face of pain, nor does God's word expect us to easily trust him during suffering. But the point of this psalm is that there is one who can. There is someone who can trust God through the most terrible suffering imaginable. 
and show him to be awesome, totally trustworthy, and someone who everyone on earth will want to, to worship and enjoy. In this psalm of David, we'll see three things. We'll see the one who trusts. We'll see the God who saves. And we'll see the nations who come. In verses 1 to 21 of the psalm, the psalmist laments his terrible suffering. But what ultimately characterises him is that he is the one who trusts. Through this intense, real-world suffering, he struggles but never slips. He cries out but never stops trusting. He suffers terribly but never gives up hoping in his God. Look with me at the first five verses of the psalm. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? O oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. Here and I recently watched the, the Danny Boyle film, 127 Hours. Uh, it's a true story about a chap, I think he's in his 20s in, in America, who went out uh, to the middle of nowhere to climb and explore in a canyon. The trouble was he didn't tell anyone where he was off to and he had a freak accident he fell down the canyon and um, a boulder fell on top of him trapping his arm and it was so seriously trapped this, this uh, boulder was so massive and heavy that he couldn't escape. He couldn't get out and and as the camera sort of stayed with him in, in the canyon, um, one thing that occurred to me was he didn't really cry out for help that much. Like, there was almost no point in calling out because no one was going to hear him. It was almost like a waste of breath for him to be crying out for help. For the psalmist, uh, crying out to God is is not a mark of despair, but a mark of trust. Even when he says that God has forsaken him and he is alone, even when he feels trapped in searing pain in the middle of a remote and uncaring, as it were, wilderness, he cries out to his God, my God, my God. And even when God doesn't answer, that doesn't stop him. He keeps crying out to him. In verses four to five, uh, we get the Exodus imagery of the psalmist's forefathers in Egypt uh, under the hot sun and the tyranny of the slave drivers, crying out to God. Compare verse two to verse five, have a look at them. O oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. Look at verse 5 now. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. The psalmist knows his God. He knows the history of how God has looked after and rescued his people. He's following the same pattern as his forefathers. Like them, he's crying out to God. Like them, he's trusting God. 
And like them, he is expecting a God to rescue him. He is the one who trusts. Look now and follow along as I read from verses 6 to 10. But I'm a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth. And from my mother's womb you have been my God. When our children were babies, um, they're school age now, but when they were babies, we um, had this Bible that had a fluffy cover, cover and it was called the Teddy Bear Bible. And, uh, and every night, even though they were tiny, uh, they didn't, seemingly didn't understand anything, we used to uh, you know, hold them in our arms and read to them from the Teddy Bear Bible. And I was reading the Bible with my daughter, who's, as I say, school age now, a few weeks ago. And she um, said to me, as we, as we were talking about something we'd read uh, in the Bible, she, she, she said, I was born a Christian. That's what she said. And, uh, and I said to her, you know, I explained how that wasn't quite right. But it's an interesting thing for her to say, isn't it? Um, and in some ways, it's true. She, um, straight away, she, <laughs> she was bored. We brought her home and we started reading the Bible to her. We started reading the teddy bear Bible with her every night. The psalmist talks about how his relationship with God was forged um, as he was born. And how he learned to trust in God as he was breastfeeding as an infant. And the question is, how can the psalmist give up on God now when he has been his God since he was a baby? So he trusts. He puts up with feeling like a worm, with being mocked by seemingly everyone. And even the jibe of verse 8. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him for he delights in him. They can mock his trust. But they can't destroy it because he is the one who trusts. Read along with me now at verses 11, 11 to 18. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion, and poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me down in the dust of death, for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers surrounds me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. In the hospital room, the patient lies alone and unconscious. All you can hear is the beeping of the monitor and the beeping 
becomes one long beep. But no one comes to help. This shows something of the hopelessness of these verses only. I didn't mention that it's the, the psalmist's enemies who have, as it were, put him in the hospital. The warning signs are there in verse 11. Trouble is near. Then come the bulls and the lions. Verses 14 to 18 describe mental and physical disintegration. It's heartbreaking. It's horrible. I am poured out like water. My heart is like melted wax. My strength is dried up. This is the end for the psalmist. He says, you lay me in the dust of death. Verses 16 to 18 could perhaps be described as an out of body experience as wild dogs come to devour his carcass. He is able to count his bones and his clothes are divided and stolen. And yet, this is the one who trusts. He keeps crying out. Look at verses 19 to 21. Read along with me. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O oh, you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. We get three words for the same thing. Deliver, save, rescue. Deliver me from the dogs. Save me from the lions. Rescue me from the bulls. Do not be far off. Here is the one who trusts. It's such an important point that in some of the gospel accounts, we are told in two languages what Jesus cried as he died. Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's, of course, the first line of our psalm, Psalm 22. On the cross, Jesus took David's words as his own. He says, I am suffering and dying, but I trust my God. I am the one who trusts. Jesus, David's greater son, is the one who trusts. The American preacher Tim Keller has said of Psalm 22, reading this psalm is like standing on holy ground. And as we read it and reflect on it, we shouldn't be too quick, I think, to run out and say, I'm going to do the same thing. The trust of Jesus Christ must first and foremost be admired. Our pain threshold is nowhere near his. As we think of our own pain, we must say, he bore that pain and more. He was forsaken by God and brutalised in every way 
by his enemies. And yet he trusted, he trusted God to the end. It is only as we gaze intently on his pain and his trust and with prayer and God's help that we can begin weakly, imperfectly, to trust our God in pain as he did. But in quoting this psalm, Jesus was also referring to what comes next in the psalm. Of course, the one who trusts doesn't just trust in anyone. He trusts in the God who saves. And the rest of the psalm turns from being a lament to being a song of praise. In verses 22 and 23, the psalmist explodes with praise to God and calls all of God's people to praise him too. Let me read those verses. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. And stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. This continues then in verse 25. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The obvious question, I suppose, is what has God done that means that the whole of Israel is praising him and in awe of him this much? Isn't this a sad story? We'll look at verse 24. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. God has heard the afflicted, the one who has been suffering and trusting in God. He heard the one who trusts and he has done what he asked him to do. He has saved him. And the psalmist, as it were, breaks the internet in ancient Israel with praise for the God who saves. God has proven the doubters, the mockers and the enemies of the one who trusted in him wrong. He was right to trust in his gods and call out for salvation. The Christian story is like the end of, well, it's like the end of almost any blockbuster action film you care to mention. You think it's all over and the hero has lost. Then things get even worse. And then out of nowhere, the hero rises like a phoenix from the ashes. When God saves the one who trusts, it is a wow moment for all of God's people. It's a total blockbuster. God is the undisputed heavyweight champion, uh, saving God in the world. Battle one was the Exodus and battle two was this. This means that when we think of the resurrection of Jesus, when God vindicated and saved his Messiah who trusted in him, we perhaps need to ramp our emotions up a bit. 
But God saving Jesus isn't just good, it's awe-inspiring. It's the best underdog story ever. It's, it's winning World War II, winning the World Cup, and eradicating coronavirus all rolled into one. And we're not praising uh, soldiers, footballers, or uh, scientists. We are praising the Lord God himself, the God who saves. And if you think I'm exaggerating, just look at what happens next. When God saves the one who trusts in him, it's so glorious that all the nations of the world are drawn to worship God. Look with me at verses 26 to 29. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. When God saves the one who trusts, it will mean blessing for the whole world and the whole world praising him. Worshipping God is seen to be such a, a positive, life affirming thing that it is twinned here with, with eating. Look at verse 26. The afflicted, so in this case it's talking about people who are suffering or poor in the world. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. And uh, look similarly at verse 29. All the prosperous of the earth shall uh, eat and worship. So worshipping God is twinned with eating, which nourishes us, is something we enjoy, and is something that kind of brings people together. And the same things can be said about worshipping the God who saves. Far from being a chore, worshipping God is nourishing, it is enjoyable, and it brings people together. We see here people coming back to God who are rightfully his, but who have forgotten about him. They've forgotten about their creator. Look at uh, verse 27. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And look at the second verse of verse, the second line of verse 29. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust. The word here translated dust or, or dirt um, takes us right back to Genesis, where humanity is created from the dust and is cursed to return to the dust. It's a picture of of many people God has created, um, but who've, as I say, forgotten about him, remembering, and turning to him and, and praising him. And the centre point and, and reason for this awakening is in verse 28. For kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. As God saves the one who trusts, he proves himself to be what he has always been, the king of the world he created. We're all familiar with the concept, I suppose, that people are easy to distract. In George Orwell's 1984, 
the novel, um, a whole society is distracted from what really matters by uh, fear and war. In Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, a similarly dystopian novel, uh, the society is distracted by the pursuit of pleasure in all its forms. What we see in this psalm is a glorious awakening for the world, the world we live in, that's being distracted and forgotten about the thing that really matters, the Lord God himself. When Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He revealed himself to be the one who trusts. And when God resurrected Jesus back to life, he revealed himself to be the God who saves. And as people across the world have heard about the death and resurrection of Jesus, they have remembered God and come in praise before him. They have come in praise before him, forgetting about the things that don't matter and remembering the one who does. The one who loves them and wants every good thing for them and the one to whom kingship belongs. The good God himself. And that's a glorious aim for us as we seek to, to tell people about the one who trusts and, and the God who saves. That our friends, neighbours, colleagues and relatives will remember God and come to enjoy him and worship him. Today we have seen the one who trusts the God who saves, and the nations who come. I love the way the psalm ends. Have a look at verse 30. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. If we're looking for ourselves in this psalm, here we are, described as posterity, the coming generation, a people yet unborn. This psalm helps us to understand the, the death and resurrection of Jesus and how glorious it is. It's so glorious that it's, it's not just for one generation, it's for every successive generation. It's for us and our children and our grandchildren. It's a message about God's righteousness and what he has achieved. He has not done it. Or as Jesus cried on the cross, it is finished. Well, as we close, let me, let me pray. Father God, we praise you for Jesus Christ, the one who trusts. We praise you that you have shown yourself to be the God who saves and the God and creator of all the earth, who the nations praise. Fill us with praise and wonder at your works today, we pray. And please make us excited to share your work and your righteousness with us. Well, praise the Lord. Thank you, Daniel, so much for that. Uh, we're going to respond to what we've just heard through singing in a moment. But before we do that, 
Uh, we're going to uh, declare these words uh, from Exodus chapter 15 together. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. I will glory in my Redeemer, whose priceless blood has ransomed me. Mine was the sin that drove the bitter nails and hung him on that judgment tree. I will glory in my Redeemer who crushed the power of sin and death. My only Saviour before the Holy Well, praise the Lord, indeed. Let's finish um, our online evening meeting tonight with those words that we began with, Psalm 68, verse 20. This is what it says. Our God is a God of salvation, and to God the Lord belong deliverances from death. Amen. Mm-hmm.